So live streaming has become another frontier of online content creation with the uh, added benefit of it being live so you can interact with your audience. However, because of the live nature of live streaming, that could cause a lot of shenanigans to occur on stream with the most scuffed, depraved, and even straight up dumb trends that streamers would do to get views and attention. So that's why in this iceberg, we're gonna explore the dumbest live stream trends. So you've probably heard of hot tub streams from a bunch of YouTubers and other streamers that have been lashing against Twitch and other hot tub streamers. So to give you a good example of what a hot tub stream is. Oh my God, I got my skirt wet. This is an example of a hot tub stream. Of course, the huge controversy surrounding this genre on the platform is how is it allowed to exist in the first place? It's basically like an excuse to create softcore you know? Not really the family friendly shit you want to show everyone when you want to show some nice clean fun. I've seen streamers get banned for the most minute shit. And Twitch even has policies that are super strict on sexual content. But it could be related to this policy back in 2016 where the platform made official that streamers don't have to be involved in any gaming content, allowing hosts to do chatting, streams, and any other IRL categories, which included hot tub and bathtub streams. Now the hate for hot tub streams come from any and all directions, you know? I'm sure not many advertisers want to be on the platform where the most popular content is just scantily clad women just sitting in a little pool of water. Other women streamers have also voiced concerns about getting unwanted social pressure from their viewers to do a hot tub stream. Just because some female streamers do things really sets other streamers, female streamers up for bullshit. And it f***ing pisses me off. Like I'm all about getting that bread. I am. I really am. I'm like, yes, queen, do the hot tub stream, but please don't do it on Twitch because it makes my life miserable because then I have people coming from your chat where they see your hot tits covered in bubbles to my chat asking to see mine. Especially because now that Twitch has dedicated a specific category that you can just look up on the platform, there are a bunch of haters and harassers that can just scroll through the numerous streams and just choose random hot tub streamers to bully. Some also believe that the genre is just filled with women streamers trying to get easy views and attention with low effort content. You just basically have to look hot and sexy and just talk to your five viewers. And there are also those that just basically hate the idea of IRL streaming in general. That these hot tub streams and any other streams that aren't video game related kind of goes against the idea of Twitch as a whole, you know? Okay, so this is one of the most popular methods that streamers would do would be to just react to other people's content. I've already discussed about reaction content in my previous videos, link in the description. It's basically a habit that almost all streamers do, no matter how big or small small their viewership is, where they would just watch some YouTube videos along with their chat and react to said video. For me personally, I don't really mind if people watch my videos and make a reaction video or a live stream out of it. You know, go ahead. Hopefully you give me like a pity laugh or something, you know. Of course, there are plenty of detractors that scold these said streamers for basically stealing content. And let's be honest with ourselves. The reactions that these streamers do are not that transformative. In fact, a rock protruding from the ceiling, as soon as he puts his weight against the rock, it breaks loose. Where's your dad? Uh. Little credence should be put in what anyone says about a shot or even the number of shots. These things coming upon a person suddenly are generally extremely inaccurately recorded in their memory. One of the authors asked one deer hunter last fall how many shots another hunter less than 100 yards away had fired. The Not really the most in-depth commentary that you can give to a video. Sometimes you just leave and then they just let the video play out for their viewers to watch 
and these streamers would also upload these reaction streams onto their YouTube, which potentially steals views and ruins the search engine optimization of the videos that they watch. Hell, some of the streamers watch movies and TV shows on stream, which is of course ripe for the shanking that is the DMCA takedowns. In regards to reaction content, just recently, XQC has been getting some heat from content creators for making these lazy reaction videos and he's been beefing with creators on Twitter or X sorry he also did a live debate with Ethan Klein on the H3 podcast and see how many views you get oh he's crying in the corner he, oh okay sure I mean that's content man it's, ori it's hey, original that's content at least like yes it? do that bro like do it? It? That's like that, yes. dude do it I love it, man. Bro, this is the most funny event yes, in the great. past four years, bitch. It's, it's awesome. Do a week of no React content. And look, this has been an issue for a long time, probably since live streaming started becoming popular. And do you think streamers would stop watching YouTube videos and making react content to it? Nope. So have you ever been scrolling through your TikTok for you page and then you see some live streams that look like this? Thanks for the glue thing. Thanks for the roses. It smells so good. Thanks for the glue thing. Thanks for the TikToks. Thanks for the glizzy. Thanks for the corn. Thanks for the glizzy. Well, you just had a sneak peek into a new phenomenon on TikTok called NPC TikTok Live. And people call these streams NPC TikTok because there's just so many of them. And most of the time, there's not really much going on, or some even claim that these are like pre recorded and fake. I think the idea of an NPC TikTok Live started with this lady at Pinky Doll. If you just take a look at one of her streams, I think you can get the idea where people got the NPC name from. You think, do you think, huh? Woo! Drug, money gun, I got your name. Wow, a lot of gift for you. Hee haw, yes, you gotta feel like a cowgirl. I'm ready, huh? Now, many people have been making these kinds of streams because Apparently, they're getting a lot of money. I didn't even know about this until my sister told me about it. So during these live streams, viewers can send in something called stickers. It will be like a little ice cream icon, rose, birthday cake, or something like that that just pops on the screen. Users would purchase these stickers using TikTok coins that are bought with real world money on the TikTok app or website. And apparently, streamers can actually redeem those stickers to convert them into gift coins, which then can be converted to digital diamonds. And once they've collected $100 worth of digital diamonds, they can actually cash those out for real life money. So these streamers that are just like doing random shit on TikTok are actually rolling in cash. IRL streams is a genre of streaming where it's basically just like a live vlog, you know? You can do an IRL stream of yourself going around, hanging around in town, hanging out with friends in real life, you know, getting in trouble with police, getting drunk at multiple bars, plenty of other crazy shit you can do in public. And it's one of the most popular non-gaming genres, which helped diversify the content you'd find on streaming platforms like Twitch and YouTube. You know, it's definitely an easier way to get into live streaming, especially if you're not into video games. You could do cooking streams, you could showcase your day job or something like that. You could do just chatting, which is one of the most popular streaming categories ever. Uh, you could do ASMR streams, you could do a gym stream, so you can show off your workouts and your pecs and shit. Uh, it's a very broad genre. Now, because you're live streaming in a public space, that basically means that people might actually come in and try to stream snipe your stream, you know? Basically, just try to stalk you, try to get some 15 minutes of fame, you see something goofy on stream or something. Sometimes live streaming in a public space could actually get the streamer into trouble, such as swatting, like when Ice Poseidon got banned from Twitch after he was swatted on a flight from Phoenix, where someone falsely claimed that he was going to bomb the airport. And this event was so prominent that it actually made mainstream news. And of course, it was kind of dumb on ice because he accidentally told his chat what gate he's flying from. He also stole money from his fans in the crypto scheme. There's also another event where people would like 
raid a restaurant that streamers will be eating at while they're like IRL streaming, such as Ice Poseidon. He got stream sniped from some dudes, sprayed a fire extinguisher on him. He's also facing five years in the die prison. Never mind, they're letting him go. They could get robbed on stream. This a robbery. Someone could say some slurs or death threats on stream. Maybe some randos flash their cock and balls on stream to try to get them banned. And of course, there's always creepos trying to prey on solo women streamers. The guy in dark clothes. Oh, he's there. He's there. Do you see him? But he's like covering his entire clothes with the black mask as well. He's like ninja. And that's basically the gist of IRL streaming. You know, it's more risky, especially if you're in a public space, but most of the time it's been dominated by just, just chatting streams where it's just like the streamer just talking to their audience through chat. Holy hell. Okay, I'm gonna be honest. I can't believe streamers were able to get away with this and are still able to get away with this. Gambling streams are where streamers would play online slot machines and they would live stream themselves playing to their audience mostly comprised of young impressionable kids who should not gamble the problem is that many of these streams are sponsored by these gambling sites such as stake.com or on them later it's been allegedly said that they would skew the odds in favor of the streamers to make it look like they're winning like big gazillion dollars most of the time they're not even betting their own money the money supplied by the sponsorship in the first place and just remember the house always win you will lose however these young impressionable kids would watch these streamers win these big juicy jackpots of a million kajillion dollars and believe that they can get the same gains that XQC or Trainwrecks can get on stream. I wouldn't be surprised if some kid got mommy's visa card and tried to gamble on stake.com just to face the harsh reality that they just wasted $50 on some slot machine and now their moms are gonna beat the hell out of them. Anyways, Twitch realized that potentially supporting underage gambling didn't give them the good image that they hoped, so they soon banned all gambling streams. And this is where good old Kick comes in, but we'll talk about them later. There was also this moment where Twitch streamer It's Slicker, uh, he basically begged his fans and fellow streamers for money because he was apparently like struggling. Turns out he was actually stealing money from his friends and fans to feed into his sports gambling addiction. So that money is not coming back despite what he says. And some even claimed that the slicker situation was the main catalyst of why Twitch banned gambling. In the first place, at least Ludwig and XQC stepped up to offer the victims their money back after getting stiffed from slicker. Sleeping streams. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. It's basically a streamer who would stream themselves going to sleep. <laughs> yeah, I, usually they would allow chat to play sounds to try to wake them up through donations. Slap you in and there are some streams where it's just dead ass sleeping, you know? You can't donate for sounds or anything. You just watching someone like roll around their bed sleeping. Like Amareth did a sleeping stream where it's just like her sticking her ass out. It's technically the laziest content that a streamer could do because they're just sleeping. They could get free ad revenue because they're just sleeping. The stream can run as long as they're sleeping because they're just sleeping. And the streamer does nothing because they're just sleeping. And this genre has become super popular and has made a resurgence on TikTok Live with the NPC sh that we just talked about earlier. They're mostly comprised of the sleep streams where you try to wake up the streamer. And there's always this one stream I see where it's just like some lady sleeping and they have like a statue of like ghost face or some scary ass statue from spirit halloween i just like stare back at the camera i think there used to be a rule against unattended content on twitch basically it's against tos to have sleeping streams 24 hour city streams animal streams zoo streams something like that however nowadays twitch tos doesn't really uh say anything against uh sleeping streams tiktok live has become the more popular platform to see this kind of content vtubers are a new form of content creator personalities where instead of seeing like a human being on the camera in their dark trash riddled bedroom that they've been in for the whole week because they've been busy streaming you would see instead like this kawaii cute like super colorful big tittied anime avatar flailing around their screen now vtubers obviously originated from japan 
and the trend started around mid 2010s but has soon become an international online phenomenon in the 2020s and as of now there are about more than 10,000 active vtubers throughout the entire internet technically the first vtuber in my opinion would be the annoying orange you know what i mean you know he didn't have like the anime avatar but he was an avatar of an annoying orange you know anyways the actual verse vtuber that popped off in youtube's algorithm would be kizuna i uh, she was also the first content creator that called themselves a virtual youtuber and within 10 months of her debut she garnered over 2 million subscribers and she even got a government job she became the culture ambassador of the japan national tourism organization and people took a liking to her especially because the concept of a vtuber was so novel at the time now the success of kizuna ai led to a lot of corporations to that specialize in virtual and augmented reality technology to create vtuber agencies such as niji sanji and hololive and at the same time, there were a plethora of independent VTubers from Japan and the United States. But it didn't take until the pandemic that we're experiencing recently for VTubers and live streaming as a whole to really gain so much traction, you know? People stuck at home who are sick of jerking off all day started to watch more and more live streams, thus bringing VTubers into the limelight. And it got to the point where platforms like YouTube and Twitch started to notice and market these VTubers to a wider audience. And this explosion in popularity led to more expansion in the VTuber space. We got V Shoujo, one of the first VTuber uh, agency companies based in the United States that were founded in November 2020, and they'd feature VTubers such as Nanners, Iron Mouse, and Project Melody, who actually started out as the first 3D rendered hentai cam girl. And she currently has over 325,000 followers on Chatterbait. And to further expand the audience for VTubers, Hololive and Niji Sanji began debuting English speaking VTubers. Hololive's Gargura soon became the most subscribed VTuber on YouTube with 4.35 million subscribers. Even like mainstream human live streamers like Pokimane and Lily Pichu started experimenting with VTuber avatars. Now, now, for the reason why they're hated, I was doing some research on why people hated VTubers, mostly because there's still a stigma against like anime culture and, and like weebs and all that. But I found this Reddit post on r slash unpopular opinion, and I think this post basically just sums up all the reasons on why people hate the VTubers. So I'm just gonna read this out verbatim for y'all. I really, really, really dislike VTubers. They're not funny, they're not cute and they sure are not entertaining. I really can't stand these 2D anime characters all over YouTube or Twitch, and I don't see why they're so f hyped either. All there is is just a female or middle-aged man behind these anime characters playing a video game or chatting or whatever, and people are eating it up. I prefer to go back where Sims will just donate crazy money to Pokemon and Linity or Amaranth because at least those are people you know are females and not a fat bastard sitting behind the computer screen trying to act all kawaii and shit. There's this one VTuber who raised more than $10,000 in a few f***ing hours. How? Why is it when I accidentally clicked on Guru's live stream and someone donated $3,000 to her when all she does is talk with that f***ing annoying ass voice of hers and play some f***ing game? Why is there clips or compilations of VTubers doing the smallest things? For example, a sick version thought it would be funny just editing VTubers making these stupid ass sneezes when they think they were cute to put them in a compilation. Or you got these videos with sexualizing titles of whatever VTuber in it like it's a hand tire or something. But yeah, I hate VTubers and I wish they'd go and die, but sadly, I don't believe that's happening because we got sad and lonely fat virgins who will never get a girl in their lives and have to live donating money just for these VTubers to say their name. But they bust a huge nut after that. But yeah, f**k all VTubers. Peace. And there was also recently that VTuber concert that went viral on social media like Twitter and TikTok. And VTubers kind of became the butt of jokes for a few weeks. Like, like, come on, look at this shit. 
Like, you paid like $200 to see this? Streamlabs is a company that specializes in software for live streamers. Now, their most popular software is Streamlabs OBS. And judging from the name, it's obviously best on the open source software OBS Studio. Now, the situation with Streamlabs is that the OBS Studio team claimed in a tweet that Streamlabs used the name OBS without their permission. And it gives the false appearance that they partner up with OBS Studio to make Streamlabs OBS. This tweet from OBS Studios caused a huge backlash amongst the Twitch community, causing many to boycott their product unless things were changed. And it also caused other companies such as Elgato and Lightstream to speak up on Twitter, claiming that Streamlabs also copied their products as well. Now, the huge backlash and the boycott, the threats of a boycotting led to Streamlabs renaming their software into Streamlabs Desktop. You know, personally, you know, now I'm not a big fan of a huge corporation blatantly copying products, especially from OBS, which is a free and open source program. Livestream Fails is a subreddit where they compile all of the fails that happen on live streams, where there's just some embarrassing moment that happened on stream. Maybe someone said an edgy joke that kind of went too far. Someone slipped the N word on stream or just some wacky shit that just happened to be caught on a live stream. You know what I mean? And this subreddit where viewers and streamers who need some react content can relive these moments of embarrassment or failure. So if it's just a subreddit where they just showcase short clips of streamers embarrassing themselves or some funny moments, what could be the problem with that? Well, this subreddit has become a heated topic among the Twitch community because it has basically become the hub center of Twitch drama. According to this article from Kotaku, quote, over time, the board made allowances for clips of streamers succeeding, stirring up drama, or generally being interesting as well. And because of the leniency of those rules of allowing drama clips and just other clips, most users on that subreddit will begin uploading clips of streamers stirring up drama among other streamers. And most of these clips are obviously taken out of context and are used to either start a hate train on other streamers or to just like stir up dr like drama that's unimportant at the end of the day. And this leads to bigger streamers going to live stream fails to uh, dig into the drama and add their own input into it or even like further add on to the drama. And it just becomes a cycle of toxicity among the Twitch community. In the same Kotaku article, they claim that Livestream Fails user base audience tends to skew towards right-leaning men. So that means there's plenty of threads attacking SJWs, many threads mocking women streamers and their white knight fans. And you know, they obviously sh on women using sex appeal to get views and attention on Twitch. And at the end of the day, the subreddit's original goal of being a one-stop shop to see funny streamer clips had just like degened into this gathering ground where people miserable about themselves decide to indulge into other people's lives to wreak havoc and stir up drama just so they can see like the world burn or something, you know what I mean? So this is gonna be a long laundry list of all the dumb sh Twitch has done to its creators over the years, which includes bad policies, unwarranted bans, and obvious bias towards popular streamers. We've already discussed the hot tub escapades and the gambling issue that was happening on Twitch, but there's plenty of other things Twitch has f***ed up about. And one of the first things I want to talk about is an event that I like to call in June 2020, Twitch received a large wave of DMCA takedown notices aimed at year-old VODs and clips that contained copyrighted music from 2017 to 2019. This means that most, if not all streamers, would be bombarded with copyright strikes that could terminate their channel unless they decide to remove all their VODs and clips that did not contain copyrighted music. Now, this provoked a huge backlash on Twitch. This basically means that a majority of the streamers' content from the past is now just gone and cannot be easily accessed. Hopefully, fans of popular streamers have extensive archives because if not, that shit is gone. And there's also complaints that these strikes were issued based on viewer created clips, meaning that the creator didn't have any control on creating that clip in the first place if it had copyrighted content. And another thing to 
on Twitch about is how it handles harassment and hate speech. On June 2020, a number of women had stepped forward with accusations towards several streamers about sexual misconduct and harassment from chat or other methods. Twitch said that it reviewed all these reports and would comply with law enforcement to see if they can get any investigative efforts to commence. However, some streamers on Twitch believe that the platform could do more to help out these streamers that have been affected with these harassment and hate speech campaigns, such as preventing these incidents in the first place or protecting others. This led to June 24th, 2020 to become a Twitch blackout day where streamers would not stream anything to show support for. The streamers that have been affected by harassment and hate speech which unfortunately Twitch was not able to do anything about. Of course, there are some streamers that didn't participate in the blackout, but by the evening of June 24, 2020, Twitch had placed several bans on accounts that have been accused of perpetuating harassment and hate speech and stated in a blog post that they would be forwarding all these details to law enforcement and hopefully that the appropriate authorities could take down these accounts. So one other thing that I almost forgot to mention were the Twitch ad guidelines that almost ruined the platform. Back in June 2023, Twitch had introduced new rules governing how burned in ads could be run on the site. So what kind of ads am I talking about? I'm talking about the ones where they have like graphics or like pre-recorded ads or commercials that are directly embedded into the stream. So to basically summarize the new guidelines that Twitch were proposing to the streamers, any on stream Stream ads or logos are limited to 3% of the screen size. You cannot have any burned in video ads or any display ads or any audio ads. Now, one of the biggest problems with these guidelines is that it just severely, severely limits what kind of ads that streamers can embed into their streams. And that's important because most of the big creators and big streamers on Twitch rely on the sponsorship money to uh, keep doing live streams streaming as a career and it sparked a huge controversy among Twitch creators with many telling the platform to reverse these guidelines and some even threatening to switch to other platforms like YouTube and Kick. And the controversy was so bad that hours after Twitch announced these guidelines, they said that they would walk them back. And, you know, they basically apologized and said, we done goofed, you know. These guidelines would be very harmful to Twitch creators and they're removing them immediately. Coming! I'm coming! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Now, if you're into live streaming, you probably heard of this new platform called Kick. In fact, this platform is backed by Stake.com, one of the crypto gambling sites where people could gamble Bitcoins through slot machines. And of course, this was one of the most popular platforms that streamers would play on when they did gambling streams before it was banned on Twitch. Now, Kick was founded in 2022 as a competitor to Twitch with a focus on looser moderation and higher revenue shares for streamers. In fact, it only had a 5% revenue charge, meaning that 95% of the revenue earned by content creators was given to those creators. And they also made deals in 2023 with multiple streamers that basically just swept them up from Twitch, such as Hikaru Nakamura for his chess streams Aiden Ross and XQC, who recently just went through a $100 million deal with Kick. And the rise of Kick has been a controversial one due to the fact that they're financially backed by Stake.com, which is a online gambling site where they had streamers who have young, impressionable kids in their audience gamble away on a sponsored live stream. And this gambling revenue is probably how Kick was able to afford the 95 to 5 split amongst the streamers in itself. I'm pretty conflicted on this because on the one hand, competition is always at the benefit of a consumer because it keeps the other platforms like Twitch and YouTube in check. However, the fact that it basically just blew up because it relied on its gambling revenue is kind of sus. I mean, to be fair, Amazon and Google aren't the most innocent corporations either. So you ever had a conversation with someone who's been 
really into Twitch or just like, Oh, that's Monka S, dude. Why did you do that? Oh, you drive me Monka S, dude. I don't want to go in the front seat with you. Dude, I'll make it loud, dude. That was funny as fuck. Probably one of the most popular Twitch emotes at the time would be Pog Champ, you know? Yo, that was Poggers. As you can tell, this emote is used when something exciting was going on on stream. And as of January 2016, I'm sorry I couldn't find a newer statistic, it has been used for a total of 813,916,297 times until it was removed by Twitch in January 2016. Now for the actual face of PogChamp, it's actually streamer Ryan Gutex Gutierrez with a surprised or shock face expression, the PogChamp face, you know, going like, the original face comes from a video uploaded onto YouTube on November 6, 2010, which displays the behind the scenes footage posted on Gutex's YouTube channel, Cross Counter TV. The term PogChamp refers to a 2011 promotional video called Pogs Championship by Gutex in which he wins a game of Pogs. So what happened to PogChamp, you know? Usually I don't see that face anymore unless I use the funny 7TV or better TTV emotes. While some Twitch users in 2020 petitioned for Twitch to remove Gutex as the face of the PogChamp emote, following numerous claims of Gutex promoting far-right conspiracies, such as anti-vax conspiracies, and spreading misinformation about COVID-19. In January 6, 2021, Twitch announced that they would remove the original PogChamp emote after Gutex made tweets about a woman who was shot and killed in the January 6 US Capitol attack. Gutex referred to her as the MAGA martyr and characterized her death as an execution. And Gutex responded to the removal of the original PogChamp critically, basically just saying that social media companies being able to just sift through people's posts and judge their character is not that great for people in the long run. Even though Gutex in the past stated that he's not the biggest fan of being the PogChamp face. And Twitch would later replace the PogChamp emote uh, with this little rotation where they would switch out the PogChamp face with other streamers every day. And then in February 11th, 2021, it was decided through a poll that they would use the Komodo Hype emote as the new official PogChamp emote. There's this feature on Twitch where you can raid people's streams. It's basically where a streamer would redirect their audience to someone else's stream, usually give that audience a big boost in viewership. It's a nice gesture, especially from big streamers where they can get thousands of their viewers to raid a small time streamer with like 12 or 15 viewers. Unfortunately, there are some who exploit this feature to basically just harass and insult streamers for no particular reason, which prompted Twitch to re reinforce their safety and privacy tools regarding raids. And when these raids would happen, they would just flood the chat with a bunch of racial slurs and they'd call women derogatory terms, call, they're basically just creating a whole storm. And apparently it's gone to the point where most of the raids were created by bots and streamers would have to counter these hate raids by putting their chat into subscriber only mode. And it's still a huge issue with live streaming, especially because Twitch tried to eliminate hate raids, but it seems like it's still a problem to this day. Okay. I just want to preface this, that people who do this are fucking stupid. Okay. Swatting and doxing are very illegal acts where doxing is just like someone will find the home address of a content creator and publicly publish that information online and swatting is where someone would use that docking that doxing information and it would call emergency services falsely claiming that there's some high stakes hostage situation or something like that prompting a swat response to the creator's house and some people see this as some sort of prank it's just stupid swatting carries a high risk of violence and also waste the resources from the city or county that is responding to this false report because you know they have to respond to someone claiming that there's some high risk situation whether or not it's true and of course there's always the liability of things going wrong for the streamer that's been swatted or for the officers that are responding to the emergency uh, unfortunately there have been a lot of popular streamers that have been swatted live on stream which sets the dangerous precedent that if you were to become a popular streamer you could get swatted and have like cops with guns drawn coming at your door and you don't seem to understand a shame you seem an honest man throughout the years on 
Twitch and YouTube and other platforms, there have been a lot of canceled streamers because they did a lot of heinous shit and caused them to basically ruin their reputation and lose their online platform. Now, one of the first ones I want to talk about is Fedmeister. On June 27, 2020, fellow offline TV members Yvonne and Lily Pichu came forward with sexual misconduct allegations involving Fedmeister. Yvonne stated that Fedmeister would enter her room uninvited, lay down on her bed, and begin inappropriately touching her. Lily Pichu also stated that Fedmeister would also enter her room uninvited and make inappropriate advances on her. Now, these allegations resulted in Fedmeister getting the boot out of the offline TV house. Pokemon also later discussed that Fedmeister also made unwanted advances on her, and that fueled a growing distrust between them. Pokemon later conveyed how the situation with Fedmeister basically contributed the most to her leaving the offline TV house. She even talked about how the entire house had an intervention with Fed. We basically talked about every time he's like acted inappropriate or made someone uncomfortable. Ever since he's been kicked out of offline TV, there hasn't been much activity from Fedmeister. I think there was that one time he tried to make a comeback, but it didn't really go anywhere. And he also got banned from Twitch back in February of this year because he tried to live stream the Super Bowl and you know DMCA shenanigans and shit. Miss Q Gemini was an infamous streamer because of the clip that went viral online where she was basically caught cheating in CSGO. You know what's really sad? That sometimes, you know, because I'm female in Counter-Strike, people are like, you're cheating! Stop shooting me! Because I'm female in Counter-Strike, people are like, you're cheating! They're mid. Mid. And all mid. Oh, I'm ah, Just why did I reload? What the f Oh my god, I'm stupid! Wait, what the f Clara! Hold on. Clara, give me one second. Clara. Let me just message this girl. Give me one second. Why the f is this on my computer? Soon after, Miss Q Gemini attempted to restart her gaming career or her live streaming career under a new name, the Jin. But people continued to spam Clara, what the f and you know start kept referring to the cheating clip but she deleted her twitch page probably because of all the viewers referencing this clip now including valkyrie because she apparently got canceled because she used the african-american vernacular english phrase no cap on a stack for real for real and she apologized about using the phrase and told her audience that she educated herself about aave and didn't want to offend anyone okay this one's a bit of a troll one because who the f cares like the fact that she apologized about this like it basically just sets the stand that people are just absolutely terrified of offending anyone i bet someone's offended that i'm like fat or asian or something right now watching this video you know she's acting like she said hard r or something even one of her mods sent her a list of these aave words that you can't use and we're gonna go over some of these words that apparently non-black people can't say child period bay every fucker uses bay sus Every 12 year old uses sus, simp, hella, tea, as in spill the tea, lit, fam. Every motherfucker uses fam back in like 2016 when that shit is still relevant. The last year we're gonna talk about is Atrioc, okay? On January 30th, 2023, Twitch streamer Atrioc came under fire after getting caught purchasing explicit deep fakes of several high profile streamers such as Pokemon, Maya Higa, and QT Cinderella. And basically these deep fakes are just their faces superimposed on video so it makes it look like they're the ones getting like engaging with another person now these women streamers that were affected by the site that he purchased have obviously spoken out against a truck and the idea of deep fakes uh cutie cinderella was the most notable amongst them because she made an announcement claiming that she would sue the site's creator and a truck would also give a tearful apology on a live stream after the situation was revealed uh, i want to say first of all that it's true i looked at a deep fake porn video of streamers. I already feel deeply, I'm deeply embarrassed about this. I'm, I'm deeply I'm embarrassed, I'm angry at myself. I've done a lot on this stream to like, create a pattern of behavior where I really want, especially women on Twitch to feel safer. Like I- And this led to a six month break from streaming until Atrioc made an update video where he explained what he had been up to. It's been six months. 
since I've updated here and I wanted to give you an update. In February, I spent about $60,000 with a law firm that was already working with a lot of online women creators to get stuff taken down. This was already stuff they'd been working with before. They knew this, this team. I was just helping pay for it. By March and April, I started to work with a company called Kertas, which was originally developed by a man named Dan Purcell to help OnlyFans creators with like leaks of their paywalled content. But it turns out the technology could have other applications that were very useful. And basically what it does is it helps scan the internet, it's like a bot, uh, and automatically issue DMT takedowns the second it finds infringing content. Uh, but I would appreciate just for mine and Ari's sake and don't have to hang around. You know, it's a big internet. And there's somewhere else to watch and someone else you can enjoy. Uh, but hanging around here and, and harassing me and my family is, uh, I would appreciate it if you didn't. Uh, and that's it. That's that's the update. Uh, I'm excited to make videos. Uh, excited to keep working on this and excited to stream. Now this serves as a good segue into weird and sexual things that women streamers have to deal with on a daily basis. And uh, this consists of like compilations of girl streamers moaning or farting or some shit. There's also like feet compilations, thick compilations, fap compilations. One of the most popular streamers to get these sort of compilations is Pokemon. Uh, she usually gets the brunt of the whole sexual videos. It's mostly just lonely losers who objectify women because they got Coomer brain on the mind 24 seven, you know, they're just sitting all in their dark goon cave jacking off to this because they can't get women. Um, there's also a lot of subreddits that would compile these weird creepo videos and pictures of like creep shots of their butt or something. Like there's just, it's just like pictures of the girls getting out of their chairs to go to the restroom. And then there's like screenshots of the chat going like booba or some shit, you know of course the most recent issue amongst the weird sexual things is the deep fakes that i just talked about all women streamers have caught up this degenerate behavior just this short don't be a fucking weirdo dude in the same vein of canceled streamers i want to set aside a particular uh group of streamers that have done some horrific crimes and we're just going to talk about a few of them now the first one i want to start out is raul zito raul Lino de Oliveira Maciel. <laughs> now he's a pretty popular Fortnite streamer in Brazil, having 117,000 followers on Twitch and almost 150,000 subscribers on YouTube. His whole premise is that he makes this family-friendly Fortnite content with his f***ing neon blue and pink hair and beard. Now, according to the Civil Police of Rio de Janeiro, they said in a statement that a team from the Child and Adolescent Victims Department arrested Raul Zito on charges of rape of the vulnerable, which basically applies to victims 14 years and under. And the victims are apparently child actors hired by Raul who are between 10 and 14 years old. And apparently Raul contacted these children through Instagram, promising access to acting jobs and that they could get hired by a major TV situation. And you know, he took, once he brought them into under his wing, he obviously took advantage of them and you know, that led to his arrest. And look, I know you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but just, I just took one look at this guy and this motherfucker triggered my fight or flight, okay? Good luck surviving those Brazilian prisons, dog. Now, another pedo streamer I would like to talk about is Minilad. Minilad is a YouTuber and streamer well known for being a part of the Vanos gaming crew. And if you didn't know, they were a group of YouTubers who mostly goofed around in Gary's Mod and back when I was watching them as a kid, Black Ops 2. And they just made like a bunch of funny moments videos or like challenge videos and all that. Now on June 23rd, 2020, two women came forward with their stories detailing events where Minilad had sent them awkward messages and unsolicited nudes back when they were age 6 16 and 17. One statement posted on a twit longer reveals how Minilab would use his YouTuber status position to basically solicit young fans to send him nude pictures of themselves. He would also try to engage in sexual conversations that he shouldn't have with a kid. And Haley also added that when she was talking to Minilab, she herself was a minor at the time. And this led to Minilab addressing all the allegations on Twitter, admitting that they were true and that his actions were unacceptable and that he took full responsibility for the inappropriate behavior. Quote, I am truly and deeply sorry for what I did. I absolutely should have done what was necessary at the time and that was seeking professional help. Realizing that my actions were completely unacceptable 
and working to change my behaviors from the inside out. To basically summarize this whole event, Mini Lad showed his Mini Lad to his Mini Lads. Okay, I know I'm gonna get a lot of sh for this one, but I included Call Me Carson because I could not ignore this. You know, whether or not he actually is like a pedophile or not is based on your conclusions only. I'm not gonna say whether or not he is. So, Call Me Carson is a Twitch streamer and YouTuber who really began to gain popularity when he and fellow creator C Scoop started the SMP Live Minecraft server now the premise of this server is that you would have to live stream yourself in order to join and viewers could donate to streamers to do hits and they basically just did dumb shit for goofs and gaffs and all that now the first allegations against carson were leveled by keemstar who released a video interview with travis and fellow smp player hugbox uh, one day, uh, shortly before he told Travis, uh, everybody was up in LA and he told most of them face to face, but he called me and I picked up the phone and he was basically like, I have to tell you something. And then he told me that he did underage girls. And I think that he said that they were fans. This was then followed by allegations from Twitter user Mini Borb, AKA Sam. She claimed that she was groomed by Carson when she was 17 years old and was still in high school. According to Sam, the pair began talking after she tweeted at him at social media and apparently that Carson went straight into her Discord DMs. And her post also included a bunch of Discord screenshots, which include Carson saying that he only wanted to talk to Sam for the sexual part and that he couldn't control himself and that he also thought about Sam every time. And he also wrote about how messaging Sam was a bad idea. So Sam's allegations combined with the interview with Keemstar basically just started this huge campaign against Carson, where most of his peers would talk about their experiences with Carson. Like Jay Schlatt would upload on his uh, weekly report channel. We talked about how Carson had depression and other mental health issues. But however, that wasn't an excuse for him to act this way. Slimesicle also commented on the allegations saying that Carson revealed that he had exchanged naked photos with a girl he believed to be 17 years old. One thing to note is that Slimesicle actually reported Carson to the authorities, claiming to have filed a police report in early 2020 and another point of contention in the call me carson allegations is the age gap between carson and sam during the time that carson was dming sam on discord he was 19 years old meaning that there was only an age gap of two years now this caused the community to be divided on whether or not a two-year age gap would make carson a groomer some claim that the age gap wasn't a really big deal because people say that there are high school relationships with that same age gap and that the age of consent in other states in the united states isn't 18. however others argued that his status as a youtuber and that the fact that he chose to date a minor knowing that she was 17 makes some believe that he had some malicious intent with Sam. Since the allegations, Carson's social media account, YouTube channel, and Twitch channel lay dormant. Many thought he had quit content creation altogether and that he would just disappear from the face of the internet and never address these allegations. However, later on in 2021, Carson started to make hints of his return, such as making a cameo in a miskiff stream and making tweets that he would later delete. And this culminated into a video uploaded on August 25th, 2021, titled Moving Forward, where he basically explained that he didn't want to talk about the controversy anymore since he wanted to move past that. And he had learned new experiences from being off the internet. He also created a project called The Year of Charity, where all the profits he made from content creation and live streaming would be donated to a charity each month. And Carson would later return to live streaming on September 1st, 2021. He still continues to make content on YouTube and streaming on Twitch. Again, whether or not Carson's a pedophile or not is up to your conclusions. I am not saying he is or isn't. So you ever watched the video about the deep and scary dark web that looks underneath the mere mortal websites online? Now the deep web and the dark web have been a hot topic for many years now, especially in the mainstream media and on YouTube. And to just quickly summarize what they are, the deep web is basically just anything that can't be indexed by search engines, you know? So technically your banking page is deep web, any paywalled content is the deep web, even unlisted YouTube videos are considered deep web. 
Now, the dark web is a portion of the deep web, but it requires specific software to access it. Now, you probably heard of the Tor browser, which accesses overlay networks called dark nets. And that basically comprises the dark web. You know? Anyways, enough of the technical jargon, smargon. We're going to focus on the criminal side of the dark web. And if you have a thirst for blood and guts and torture and destruction, there's one special license just for you. Now, there's this thing called the Red Room. Apparently, it's just like a live stream where you get to watch people get tortured and ultimately get murdered after you pay a hefty fee in Bitcoin. This just became like this huge thing that spread around the internet where it's just like, oh, wow, I would love to see someone get beheaded and murdered online with my family and friends, you know? And people would showcase like images like this of an alleged red room where they would execute some ISIS members. And of course, YouTubers would take the opportunity to clickbait this topic and, you know, pretend that they found these actual red rooms and show it off to their audience. This is an iceberg video and an iceberg explained video at it. And it's my duty as the dude on your phone or screen to tell you to explain this to you. And I just want to tell you right now, at this very moment, red rooms are fake. Yeah, sorry for all the psychopaths or just curious people that want to see this. Like some people get ripped in half or something. Red rooms are not real. There's a multitude of evidence to back this claim because, you know, first of all, no one has ever found evidence of red rooms existing. There's no FBI raids. There's no videos of a red room, nothing of the sort. Any websites claiming that they're red rooms are obviously fake. Like the ISIS one I showed you, when the countdown ended, it just showed a plate of bacon getting microwaved. Any other websites claiming to be red rooms are just Bitcoin scams trying to steal your money. And the FBI has had a prominent presence on the dark web and there have been no operations, no raids whatsoever, showcasing that these live streams are actually real. And even then, the Tor browser and the dark web and the technology it uses to keep your ass anonymous is way too slow to do any live streaming because the data has to be constantly moving around to hide your online trace. What should be focused instead are the actual legitimate crimes that happen on the dark web instead of just being concerned with fake guru streams such as distributing CP and selling illegal drugs. And that was the dumbest live streams trends iceberg explained. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Don't forget to check out my Patreon if you want to support me and make these dog videos a little better. I'll see you guys in the next one.